morning. I'm Sam Cox. Uh, you're lit- serving as your leaders just this morning. Our gospel readings from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 18 through 26. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your mother and father. He replied, I have kept all these things since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, There is still one thing lacking. Sell all you own and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But then he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. It was the 25th college class reunion. It had been a great couple of days, not only meeting your peers of the past, but also seeing which one of the faculty members uh, are in now the pastoral, is in the uh, professor emeritus uh, status at the university, as well as seeing uh, who are the new and upcoming professors. Also to hear a little bit more about the student body and what was the the direction that the university was going in now, and then finally it was culminating in a banquet followed up with a a cover band that played music that you actually knew. It was interesting over these couple of days that uh, there was kind of a a common conversation that was taking place with uh, many of the graduating class of 25 years ago. It went a little bit like this. Wow, it's hard to believe 25 years have gone by, how time flies. I'm over halfway into my, past my, into my career, and, um, you know, I thought I would, I would have a better handle on things now. Uh, I thought that I would be a lot more happier now. I thought that by now I would know exactly where I'm heading and that I would have a sense of fulfillment. But what I'm left with is a sense of longing, a a sense that there's got to be more to life than this. I just wish I could be fulfilled. That is a common experience in life, especially if you've been given the opportunity to live long enough to be able to kind of look back with an eye to the future about this is where I've been and this is, looks like where I'm headed and I really thought I might be in a different place. Now, before you make too many judgment calls about this particular university, because sometimes we may have in our mind that if, you know, if I had just picked the right school to go to, or if I had hung on to uh, the, the right career path or the right major, my life would be different and would be better than it was. But this group who were celebrating 25 years, hence their graduation, were graduates from Yale, and they were successful. They were doing what they had planned to be doing. It's just that they felt that it wasn't enough. Today's scripture, I think, though this young ruler was not a 25-year graduate of any institution coming and trying to talk about fulfillment, but he was talking about life's purpose. He came to Jesus with a question about the end, 
and for us to have a good feel about where we're headed in life, beginning with the end in mind is not a bad place to start. And so he asked Jesus this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? An awesome and a good question because it lets those of us who are listening to hear that, that this person knows that life just doesn't happen and just doesn't occur. Eternal life is not a fickle fate that we fall into, but it is something that has direction and purpose, that has drives in our lives. Jesus answers the question to him that, that he knew quite well. Part of inheriting eternal life is living a moral life that God has set aside for us to live. Don't, don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. Honor your mother and father. And though we only have the text right before us, so sometimes it's, it's hard to, to read feeling and import into these words, but I can almost hear the ruler going, Whew, well, I've done that since my childhood. Then Jesus adds this caveat. Well, then, you only lack one thing. Now, quite granted, those could be words of comfort. Wouldn't it be nice to hear those words sometimes that all you lack in fulfilling your purpose in life? Just one thing. It's been, it can be reduced to just one thing. Quite frankly, if I felt like if I was in that situation, Jesus might hand me a list. Dave, you need to be working on, and the list would just kind of roll out onto the floor. Some, somewhat like some child's Christmas list, you know it does, or Santa. But no, Jesus says it's, you just like just one more thing. Go sell all that you have. Distribute it among the poor and come follow me. We, we know at that moment his heart fell. He previously probably was leaning forward, eyes wide open, ready to receive that one thing that he needs to ensure that he can inherit eternal life. But on hearing it, it saddens him. And scriptures tells us because he was a man of means, he had much wealth, and, and evidently he wasn't willing to part with that and then follow Jesus. But where I want you and me to listen up today is that you might be sitting in the pew right now thinking, Whew, thank God I don't have a lot of money. <laughs> thank goodness I'm not rich. That, that I don't have to worry about going through the eye of the needle that Jesus is, is now laying out before those. His disciples and those listening ask this very important question. Then who can be saved? It didn't ask, how can rich people get saved? It didn't ask, how can he get saved? It put all of us in the very same position. Much like maybe in that point in our lives when we're just kind of talking amongst friends about where life has been and where life is going and this sense of unfulfillment that might be in our life and we share that out loud and someone says to us, I feel the very same way. Here, they knew it was so much more than just about giving up wealth. It had everything to do with following Jesus. Jesus had said this in a different way. He said, anybody who wants to follow me, anybody who wants to be one of my disciples, they need to deny themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. Meaning that for you and me to find fulfillment in life, there must be a relationship between us and God. Someone was trying to help a, a group of people try to find out what their life purpose was or what their life purpose 
is. And they had reduced it down to five simple questions. Five simple questions that will help you determine what your life purpose is. Now, I'm not guaranteeing you that after you answer these questions, you'll like the bottom line answer, but it will give you a great insight into why you are living and what you're doing. And the first question is quite the most simplest, is that who are you? And you can answer that with your first name if you'd like to, but you may have other descriptors about who you are. The second question is what do you do? The third question is who do you do it for? <laughs> the fourth question is what do they want from you? And the fifth question is how are they changed or transformed by what you give them? Now, in that rich young ruler, he might said, oh, I'm a, a ruler, I'm a synagogue ruler. We're not quite sure what type of ruler he is in Scripture, but we do know that, that Jairus, whose daughter that was raised from the dead, he is described in one of the Gospels as a, a synagogue ruler or ruler of a synagogue and other gospels he just referred to as a ruler so he may be a who are you he, he's a ruler what what does he do he, he leads a synagogue he, he leads the people of faith he ensures that uh, everything is in place for the rabbi and that they have a rabbi in their community what do they want from him Who does he work for? What do they want from him? How are they changed? He probably could have answered all those questions, but it didn't lead to life eternal. And that's where I want you to take a moment of pause about where you are in your life as you try to seek fulfillment to make sure that your life is worthy of the purpose in which you have set it in place upon is that when you ask, answer that question, who are you, I want you to be reminded that not only are you a child of God and a person of worth, but that you are a disciple of Jesus. Who are you? You are a disciple. Because you have heard the call from God, and you are responding to that. What do you do? It can be listed in some simple ways as to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as Christ has loved you. Who do you serve? I serve God and my brothers and sisters in the world. What do they want from you? A faithful witness and follower of Christ, a servant of the Lord. And how are they changed and transformed by what you give them? They find true meaning and purpose for life like I have. These are simple questions, but ones in which we need to embrace because you might come away saying, oh, so then all of us are supposed to be preachers or Sunday school teachers or somehow involved in the life of this church. And what I'm sharing with you is, no, this world is too much has too much complexity to it for it to be totally solved by all of us being pastors or Sunday school teachers. And actually, Scripture tells us that God so loved the world. So therefore, this complexity of life must be able to be fulfilled by different and various life vocations, but they need to be in alignment. Meaning that for you and for me, there can be activities that we are participating in that is not fulfilling our God-called purpose for life. And see, we do have a God-called purpose for life. That's, I think, what the rich young ruler ran smack dab into that he realized that maybe I, he was working for himself, that he had his own vision and his own purpose for where he was heading, and that did not include Jesus. 
Sometimes we get the false understanding that God is in our life to help us achieve our personal vision or goals. Did you follow me on that? Because if you kind of sometimes look at your own prayer life, that we look at it as God is trying to help me do what I want to do in this world. But I want you to know that God is in our lives to help us fulfill God's vision, God's purpose for life. That's the reason why the young ruler turned away sad is because he was confronted with that issue. Jesus demanded obedience to his way and come, follow me. Not, the, not your design and desires for life, but mine. That can be a rude awakening for us when we're confronted just like the rich young ruler was and that maybe you right now feel a little bit confronted about that yourself. And I want you in some ways to be at peace because we don't know the final verdict on this rich young man's life. All we know is that he turned away sad because he was confronted with the truth. That may have milled around in his mind for several years after finally seeing the fulfillment of God's promise through Christ and his death on the cross and the resurrection from the dead, he may have come to believe and put his faith in him. We do not know. But we do know that Christ demands that of all of us. Hence the question, then who can be saved? Jesus ends up by answering that question to all that would hear, with you, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Meaning that God is able to intervene into your life to give you purpose, meet reason, and hope. And like I said before, not all are called to the same task. Just like a mother and a daughter who is on their hike together come across on, on their way a meadow, a field, of which the grass has grown up high enough that the, the little girl almost couldn't see her way forward, the grass bending in on the trail. But she says, Mom, do you smell that? And she said, what? I said, do you smell it? He said, I do. And they kind of follow their nose to the smell, and through the weeds, the grasses, they came across this beautiful array of flowers lost in this field because of the weeds and the grass and they took in its beauty and its aroma its fragrance you know you have met people who have lived beautiful lives in the midst of tragedy and despair and anonymity who have found their vocation in life in obscurity but yet have lived it beautifully and fragrantly in life. See, at the final end analysis, when we come before God, he's not going to ask me and you how many people knew who you were or how much did you do He's basically going to ask us, were you faithful to the mission, the purpose that I placed on your life in the place that I planted you? So if you find yourself saying, if only I could be fulfilled in this life, it may be a God question that you are facing. Are you in alignment with God and God's purpose for you. In that, you will find true fulfillment. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.